Hello viewers, this is Fahim Munem from the Editor's Guest Program. In fact, uh, today we are launching this program with our guest, uh, Ambassador Dan Muzina, who needs no introduction in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Muzina, welcome to Masranga Television Studio. Well, thank you, Fahim. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm very honored to be on your very first show. It's our pleasure, sir. Thank you. Uh, but before that, uh, Ambassador Muzina, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to convey through you our deepest condolences for the recent senseless tragedy that took place in Newtown, Connecticut. And we are deeply saddened by this sort of incident, and uh, I'd like to convey to our friends in America through you. Thank, thank you for him. I, w we're stunned. The senselessness uh, of that tragedy. I, I, I just can't understand whatever would motivate anyone to perpetrate such a, a heinous crime for no reason. reason. It makes no sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So these are very sad times for us. President mm -hmm. Obama has spoken directly and most eloquently mm -hmm. uh, to it earlier today. And mm -hmm. it's just a very sad, difficult time. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you for your, your expression of condolences. Oui. Uh, Ambassador Muzina, now let's uh, get into the program itself. Uh, I would like to start off uh, uh, with the notion that uh, everyone knows and you know that you have been traveling all around Bangladesh. And uh, in fact, mm -hmm. you have a goal to achieve, which is you want to cover 64 districts. All 64. All 64 of them. Now, uh, it seems to me and to us that uh, you are more optimistic about Bangladesh's future than any previous U.S. ambassadors that I have known. What is behind, behind this uh, optimism? Oh, I, I think first thing I, I, I would say is I'm the first American ambassador who is a retread. We call a retread. I've yeah. come back to Bangladesh. So I served here from 1998 to 2001. So I have an acquaintance with Bangladesh already. Mm -hmm. So when I came back a year ago mm -hmm. uh, in November, I, I had the foundation of, of Bangladesh. And now as I travel from Tetulia to Technoff, and soon from Salat to Shakira. The more I see Bangladesh, mm -hmm. the more encouraged I am about the, the nation's future. Anybody would be excited uh, about the future of a country that, that I see when I, when I, as I travel around, when I see the great potential, the great opportunities that are out there. And as I see Bangladeshis seize those opportunities and grow this country. And I'm optimistic because as I get to know the people of Bangladesh, I mean, I told President Zila Rahman when I gave him my credentials, I said, Mr. President, I know a little bit about Bangladesh. And Mr. President, I will tell you right now, I know of no people on earth more energetic, more dynamic, more creative, more generous, more entrepreneurial, more resilient than the people of Bangladesh. I said, Mr. President, you tell me the people who surpass the Bangladeshis in those qualities. And he sat in silence because he knows, as I know, yeah. the people of this country are exceptional. Mm -hmm. And I mean that literally mm -hmm. exceptional. And that's why I insisted, mm -hmm. I just insisted I had to come back yeah, to yeah. Bangladesh. I was supposed to be someplace else. Oh. And I said, you know, no, I have to be in Bangladesh. This was more by choice of yours. Completely by okay. choice. Okay. I said I was supposed to be someplace else. Okay. And I said, no, no, thank you very much. I must go to Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So here we are. My wife Wonderful. and I are so happy to be here. Wonderful to have you here. Uh, Ambassador Mzina, uh, as you said that you were talking about something called positive Bangladesh. We always want that Bangladesh should be viewed everywhere as a positive Bangladesh. Yes, we have our natural disasters, we have, so does many other countries. But in spite of that, there are some stumbling blocks in the path of prosperous Bangladesh. We have certain blocks where some or the other, we can't seem to cross that. What are the major blocks that you think, and how can these be resolved to achieve that prospect? Well, first you have to look at the complete picture.
And my vision of Bangladesh is Bangladesh as the next Asian tiger. And I've spoken of this. Yes. I in, envision what I call the Royal Bengal Tiger. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the Royal Bengal Tiger? Have you seen Just one? Like, never. Okay. We, so we, I'm <laughs> all, I, this is in my imagination. My children have seen them, okay. but I have not. But I see the Royal Bengal Tiger strutting across the global economic stage powerfully and proudly. And I see the next Asian tiger, Bangladesh, as the world's largest exporter of ready-made garments, the world's largest exporter of household textiles, a major player in pharmaceuticals, in building small freighters, in uh, footwear, in mm -hmm. finished leather goods, in jute, in silk, in shrimp, frozen shrimp, in bone china, all oh, the list goes on and on. So that is my image, my vision of Bangladesh as the next Asian tiger. But there are constraints. Your question mm -hmm. was focused on the challenges, That's the right. constraints. And these are very real. Mm -hmm. uh, the limitations of the port. Mm -hmm. I visited Mongla port. Uh, mostly silted up, though the new chairman of the port authority is undertaking an aggressive dredging program right. to open up Mongla port. That's right. Chittagong port has constraints of size. Mm -hmm. We know about the limitations of the roads, mm -hmm. of the railroads. We know about uh, deficiencies of power supply, of energy. We know about the challenges of corruption. We know about the limitations of rule of law. And, and even the specter, mm -hmm. possibly, of uh, political instability. Mm -hmm. So those are the challenges. Mm -hmm. Fahim, every one of those challenges, and they're serious, I don't diminish them. Mm -hmm. Those are serious challenges. Mm -hmm. But everyone, everyone, everyone is resolvable. Okay. So you know, I always say Bangladesh is a country blessed by God. It has these exceptional people, it has wonderful geopolitical location where it's, it is the nexus of the New Silk Road, the nexus of the Indo-Pacific Corridor mm -hmm. that will link Bangladesh, will link South Asia to, to the world. Yeah. And it is lucky because it has problems, challenges that are all solvable. I have lived in countries with challenges that no one, no one, no one could resolve ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but not Bangladesh. Wonderful. So I'm optimistic those Wonderful. countries, those challenges will be overcome. Wonderful. These are really words of encouragement for... Oh, I know, feel that way. Are, and the more mm -hmm. I travel, mm -hmm. the more I travel, the more optimistic You're I become getting. and more hopeful I become. Mm -hmm. When I, I, I go up to uh, Motorpur mm -hmm. and I see an ocean of pineapple, mm -hmm. or you go to Moiman Singh, and you see uh, jackfruit like you can't mm -hmm. imagine, or coconut, or bananas, and uh, other places you go, you go down it's to Kulna and the fish, of those, yeah. and everywhere mm -hmm. you go you see this mm -hmm. opportunity, you see the wealth of the country, Wonderful. because this is not a poor country, it mm -hmm. has many poor people, that's mm -hmm. a different thing, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about the country is not True. a poor country. True. It used to be known as Golden Bengal at one time, you know. Well, uh, my vision is, is, uh, a, is a, a little bit. Shona go, uh, Bangla, Shona oh, Bangla. Exactly. Uh, and now let's talk about uh, uh, another issue, which is the U.S.-Bangladesh relations. <coughs> and uh, we know that the U.S. is one of the leading trading and investment partner of Bangladesh. And our two nations have been working in many areas, <coughs> in many fields, as you probably know. Uh, today, how do you assess this relationship? Number one. And number two, what specific areas you feel that USA wants Bangladesh's partnership? Well, in terms of describing the, the relationship, <coughs> excuse me, that coffee went down the wrong place. Yes. In describing the relationship, I will quote Foreign Minister Deepu Moni. I will quote Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. They both use the same word, excellent and not excellent in a diplomatic, empty kind of way, mm -hmm. but excellent the way you read in the dictionary. Excellent means great. Mm -hmm. Our relationship is great. 
America and Bangladesh have many shared interests, many shared values. And so therefore we have a natural partnership, mm -hmm. a, a natural partnership in uh, countering violent extremism, in countering terrorist threat, and in promoting regional stability. Right. Uh, uh, global peace, you know, Bangladesh is the largest contributor to uh, international peacekeeping operations. Absolutely. Uh, in, in promoting global food security. You know, in our lifetimes, inshallah, the population of the world will hit 9 billion people. And, and when uh, Secretary Clinton came to visit me when I was ambassador in Angola, Mm -hmm. She sat like that and I sat here and she looked at me and said, you know, in our lifetime, the population of the world will be nine billion people. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And she said, it is in the interest of America that those people can eat amply and nutritiously. That cannot happen mm -hmm. if the world's seventh largest mm -hmm. nation Bangladesh, this is the seventh largest nation in the world, cannot feed itself. Mm -hmm. So that's another interest we have, mm -hmm. uh, global food security. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, America has interest here relating to trade and investment, relating to values, democracy, respect for human rights. Mm -hmm. And we have a humanitarian interest. Mm -hmm. We like to help people help themselves. So we work with Bangladesh so Bangladesh can cope with natural disasters. You mentioned natural disasters. Mm -hmm. And so we have already built or rebuilt with Bangladesh 547 cyclone shelters. Have you ever seen a cyclone oh, shelter? Yes. Oh, They're yes. huge. huge yeah. And right now yeah. we're building 116 mm -hmm. more. Is it through any kind of U.S. <coughs> assistance program? or? Yeah, these are through uh, our USAID a AID, program, right, right. they're through uh, military, our military works with your military mm -hmm. to set up a system of coastal crisis management centers. Mm -hmm. These are 30 special cyclone shelters mm -hmm. strung all along southern Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And these are set up with special communication capacity so that even when a cyclone hits, it, yeah. the communications will not be interrupted. Mm -hmm. So immediately after the storm, mm -hmm. the Coast Guard, which, the Bangladesh Coast Guard, which will man these mm -hmm. special centers, can assess the damage Wonderful. and mm -hmm. begin Wonderful. relief right. immediately, no right. delay. Right. Oh, this is very exciting. Fantastic. We're going yeah. to dedicate the first of these 30 coastal crisis management mm. centers. I think it's in March. March of... Uh, Maybe February or March, down in uh, Shanggu. Oh, in Shanggu uh, area. Yeah. Down okay. south yeah, I know of uh, Chittagong. Yes, yes. And I hope to go down there myself. Wonderful, wonderful. During Secretary uh, Clinton's visit here, uh, Secretary of State, she uh, signed a, a dialogue, uh, a kind of an oh, understanding. Oh, that was a major achievement, partnership major dialogue. Major achievement, that's what I was referring to. And uh, what amazes me or rather surprises me is that uh, you guys are interested to go for TIGFA signing it. And, uh, but you have failed, we have failed to reach any consensus on that. What are the issues that USA stands for? Why is it well, not taking place? I want to speak for a minute about the partnership dialogue. Sure. Because the partnership sure. dialogue sure. is a major step. And, mm -hmm. and when I arrived here, November 19, 2011, I shared my, my agenda. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of my agenda was to have the secretary visit and mm -hmm. to conclude some kind of agreement exactly. that would establish a formal regular dialogue, dialogue between America and Bangladesh. And so they did that mm -hmm. when the secretary visited in May. She and, and, and Foreign Minister Deepu Moni signed this, yeah. and the Prime Minister watched them yes. sign. Yes, we all and then in them. September, they held the first meeting of the Partnership Dialogue, and that was in Washington. Mm -hmm. It was a grand success. Mm -hmm. Very, very pleased. And, and 
and the purpose of the partnership dialogue is to is to look at the relationship from a strategic perspective. Mm -hmm. Is this the kind of dialogue that America and Bangladesh should be want? Having it, yeah. If not, how do we uh, relationship? Is this mm -hmm. the kind of relationship right. that America and Bangladesh want? Mm -hmm. If not, then we, we fix it a little bit. Make mm -hmm. sure this works to the There's best. A clear interest. understanding between the yeah. two. So mm -hmm. it, went, it went very well. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned TICFA, the mm -hmm. Trade and Investment uh, Cooperation, uh, Cooperation Framework Agreement. Right. I signed one of those mm -hmm. with Angola when I was when the, you were the ambassador. ambassador there. Yeah. Right. I think it took us six weeks or seven weeks. I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and we signed this. And what this agreement does, it does only one thing. It's a very simple agreement. It, it has one action item. It establishes a forum, a bilateral forum, uh, Bangladesh and America, to meet once a year, or could be twice, but usually once mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. And that forum will identify the obstacles to increasing trade and investment between America and mm -hmm. Bangladesh, and how to overcome those obstacles. Mm -hmm. That's it. I see. It does one thing. So I think that's a good thing to have. Uh -huh. I would like to have that form because I know that Bangladesh has issues it wants to raise with right. America. Right. And I know America has issues it would like to raise with Bangladesh. Can we get into it? What are the issues that America would like to bring up? Well, I think America would like to see ways it would be easier to invest in Bangladesh. It's not easy to invest here. And Why is I that? Could, well, because of red tape. You, you, uh, corruption. You bring uh, red tape as number one uh, hindrance. Oh, well, I'm not putting them in order. You're not putting order. in categories. I'm okay. not putting them in order. But for an, an investor to come here, there are, there are obstacles. It takes forever. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I lived here last time, an American company, the largest manager of ports in the whole world, the name of that company was SSA, mm -hmm. was trying to invest in Chittagong and, and build a whole new terminal. Mm -hmm. It was trying to build a barge terminal mm -hmm. in Dhaka and a f run a fleet of barges in between, mm -hmm. so not rely on the road or the railroad connection right. to Dhaka. Right. Well, everybody said yes, but it never happened because it just got stuck from some political resistance from the Chittagong local area. And this American investor has spent millions and millions of dollars to do all the preparation work, to do all the environmental studies. All of this work was done. Well, in the end, nothing happened. So that it's kind of news frustrating for you is very frustrating. Okay. It's, it's very discouraging, actually. Um, now, uh, let me move on to the uh, another sector which has been, uh, you know, news, which is the RMG sector. And in oh, the terrible fire it's, it's, Exactly. Th that's what I was referring to. Uh, regarding the safety issues in RMG sector in Bangladesh, uh, as soon as that the Tazin factory uh, incident took place, do you think it impacts uh, Bangladesh's market in the U.S.? Or, uh, yes. And what needs to be done? I think, and I have shared this, uh, my thoughts with the BGMEA, the BKMEA, the, well, uh, the Bangladesh uh, Employers Federation, BEF, right. and many of the chambers, FBCCI and DCCI and others. I've shared with them my view that the American market for Bangladesh RMG exports is at risk. America is the number one the largest single market for Bangladeshi RMG exports. But there is a there is tremendous uh, pressure in America mm -hmm. in regard to the workplace safety. The compliance uh, bit. It's, it relates to compliance. Uh, the, there's pressure coming from consumers and coming from buyers in regard to the right of workers to freely associate, to have unions. So these issues are gaining currency, and I know 
most Bangladeshis don't watch American media, they don't watch CNN, they don't watch ABC, they don't read New York Times or, or uh, Washington Post or all the big newspapers, mm -hmm. but the stories are coming and coming and coming mm -hmm. about the Indies. conditions of Bangladeshi workers. This creates a challenge and an opportunity for Bangladesh. The challenge is that access to the American market could be diminished because people will reject Bangladeshi goods, say, oh, I don't think I want to buy that. But the opportunity is this. I always look for the opportunity. Challenges, you flip over challenge, you have opportunity. The opportunity is this, that Bangladesh owners, Bangladesh government, Bangladesh workers can come together, work together, and actually address the mm -hmm. issues of workplace safety, mm -hmm. address the issues of workers' rights to organize and associate freely. And, and Bangladesh could join the International Labor Organization Better Work Program, which addresses issues of workers' rights, of yeah. workplace safety. Uh, Which I conditions. think, yeah, they, they do. And by doing this, no, they don't do that now, uh, but this is possible. Bangladesh could become a preferred brand, a qual high quality brand that people want to pay for, uh, a, a, a premium brand. That's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, I, I get your point, but uh, recently we have seen it in the news again. <clears throat> there are some people who do watch CNN and New York Times and they read that and all. There are some people, and what concerned us and some people in the media is that about seven senators uh, wrote a letter to uh, President Obama uh, requesting that uh, you know it should be revisited as far as I think your um, army, uh, the, the uniform that is made is mostly comes from Bangladesh factories, I was told, and in that report. And they had said that uh, Obama uh, personally should get involved in it. And you as an ambassador, I'm sure you send your reports, you do, what can you do to go to Capitol Hill and discuss with them? Because you have seen it in your, with your own eyes as to there are good companies and there are companies which do not comply. How can you personally get into the act also? Well, first of all, Fahim, for a point of clarification, yes. U.S. to the best of my knowledge, no U.S. military uniforms are manufactured. Okay, that's what in it was Bangladesh. in the paper. What was what was apparently manufactured in the factory, uh, Tasreen fashion factory that had the fire, were T-shirts with the Marine Corps logo okay. that were being. That's what they meant by uh, U.S. Yeah, Army. that's not a uniform. No, the, those okay. were T-shirts with the Marine Corps logo mm -hmm. being sold to civilians. Anybody, can okay. people like to wear a Marine right, right. Uh, logo? Right. So, so that's what so that's it was. So that's one. Okay. Uh, so it's not it's not a okay. uniform. Okay. Fine. But you're absolutely right. There is growing interest and growing concern on Capitol Hill in regard to the workplace conditions, in regard to workers' rights to freely associate and uh, organize. So what I can do and what I have been doing, I told you how I reach out to all the True. segments, True. owners, buyers, government, workers, to try to make people aware of these dynamics in the American market. Look, Bangladesh is a free country. Mm -hmm. The government can do what it thinks is best for the interest of Bangladesh. Owners are private owners. They own their factories. They can do whatever they think is best. They don't have to listen to an American no, ambassador. No. Buyers can do what they want. But let me tell you, there are dynamics going on in the United States that people should be aware of and should consider mm -hmm. as they make their decisions. They can mm -hmm. ignore them if they want. I mean, that's that's their privilege. Mm -hmm. Capital, um, I go to, ca every time I go back to Washington, I go to Capitol Hill okay. and I meet with staff. Mm -hmm. You always want to meet with staff. Not, mm -hmm. Don't worry about the members. <laughs> you meet with their staff. Okay. And I reach out on both the Senate and the House of Representatives mm -hmm. and I meet with staff. And we talk about Bangladesh mm -hmm. and they're very focused on Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. They're very focused on the issues I raised before about labor rights. Right. And, and that's why I want to work with Bangladesh to work through those issues. Okay. So th they're taken 
off the table as liabilities and become assets. assets. Right, right. And, and create what I call the premium brand, brand Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. That people should fight to have items made in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And the day is not far, I believe. Well, I will never quit doing what I can. Uh, Ambassador Muzina, if you just, uh, as usual with all television channels, we'll just take a very short break and I'll be back after this break. With you. Sure. Thank you. It's difficult to leave this RMG sector. Uh, let's get a focus it on now the duty-free access that Bangladesh has been buying for a very, very long time. What is it? I mean, it's still a mystery that what is it that, that is not taking place? What has happened? Is there any kind of uh, prospect that we would get into the duty-free access? Of course, you will lay out a lot of conditions and a lot of things over there. But where can we hit it so that we can access this duty-free uh, quota system? Well, I think the first step in addressing this issue, I'll be perfectly frank, I think this is a major issue. If I were Bangladeshi, I'm not Bangladeshi, but if I were Bangladeshi, I would want very much to work with America to address this issue. Because buyers tell me that there would be an increase in Bangladeshi exports to America if these duties uh, were reduced, right. but, but that's the Bangladeshi perspective. Uh, I think my job as ambassador is to help Bangladesh understand the process uh, for addressing these issues. And then it's up to Bangladesh to make the case. Mm -hmm. The first step in understanding the process is to appreciate this is an issue that is the business of the United States Congress. This is not something that President Obama can do, is not something that, uh, that an American ambassador can do. This action lies with the Congress. So Bangladesh must convince uh, the members, or at least half of the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives that eliminating these tariffs mm -hmm. is in the interest of the United States. That's the, that is the bottom line. So how do you do that? First of all, you have to create an enabling environment. Okay. No, I would never get a lobbying to start with. Okay. You must create an environment that is open to considering this issue. So right now, when you go to you go to Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. as I do every, every time in Washington, I go to Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. like I said, people talk about labor rights. The staff, they're concerned about labor rights, concerned about Grameen, concerned about Rohingyas. Those are the issues they talk about. So if, if your intent is to get positive action on lifting uh, tariffs, right. then you must first remove those irritants because that's what people are focused on so you can it's hard to make yeah, a I case point, yeah. when people are talking about labor rights mm -hmm. so once those issues are diffused and they i can see a way to diffuse each one you do sure uh -huh. then maybe bgmea bkmea they want to engage some expertise in washington and working with the bangladesh embassy in washington and working with the Bangladesh government in Dhaka, then you present your case. Why it's in the interest of America to eliminate or reduce these tariffs. Yeah. You make your case. Yeah. And then, and then it, the issue is, is, is voted on, and then eventually it will win or lose. But, but that's the approach The case to has use. to be made, yeah. You okay. have to make the case. Yeah. And it can be a very strong case. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did touch the subject of investment, which you said about the red tapism and other things, the U.S. investment in Bangladesh. We did touch that. Uh, now I'm trying to move into a different area, which is how can you as ambassador, U.S. ambassador here, uh, assure the Bangladeshi students, and there are many uh, who are studying in the United States. And uh, in fact, I was really surprised that this time a lot of uh, students didn't even come for the summer vacation because of the recent Nafiz's incident that if they come back, they won't be allowed back 
and how can you assure them that that was one of those incidents which had nothing to do with the U.S. immigration policy or that Bangladeshi students are, you know, free like any other students uh, anywhere in the world. Can you throw some light on that? Well, you don't have to listen to my words. Just look mm -hmm. at the facts. The number of students, of Bangladeshi students studying in the United States uh, is increasing very rapidly, extremely rapidly. And I'm very pleased. My goal, starting from the base of, of 2011, I would like to see a, a doubling or tripling of the number of Bangladeshi students in the United States. Uh, why not? The, the, there are about 3,000 there now. There should be 10,000. I would think within a decade should be 30,000. And the uh, visas are the, the issuance uh, is unchanged in the wake of, of the Nafis incident. You know, that's, that's one person who had his own agenda. I mean, that's a story in its own right. Mm -hmm. But uh, qualified students will continue to get visas to study in the United States. So that kind of assurance, we can, uh, you know, uh, get it from you. That well, the numbers speak for themselves. They yeah, they do, but the increase. perception, uh, Ambassador, is that, oh, my God. I mean, can you imagine that uh, some kids didn't even come for summer vacation here thinking that uh, they won't be allowed back? So I just thought, since I have you on this show, that maybe you can assure them that that's I not a problem. I think I've just given the okay, assurance wonderful. that qualified students will continue to get visas. Wonderful. Another area, which is uh, in the recent U.S. presidential elections, we have seen a number of Asian voters and a mm. lot of Bangladeshi voters and the uh, Bangladesh origin U.S. citizens. Uh, how do you see them in American politics? Well, Bangladeshi Americans number about half a million. Uh, and I have set for myself the goal of hunting them all down. <laughs> And it's not, that's going to be a, a challenge. Why would it be that? Because I want to engage the Bangladeshi diaspora mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. Many of them are doing very well. In fact, mm -hmm. I would say almost all of them are doing well. Mm -hmm. Within one generation, they go from taxi driver to medical student. Mm -hmm. And I would like to engage the diaspora to... Uh, to uh, give back to Bangladesh, either through philanthropy or through investment. Because when they give back, they promote a prosperous Bangladesh. A prosperous Bangladesh is good for America, it's good for South Asia, mm -hmm. and especially good for the people of Bangladesh. I have to tell you, Fahim, in June, my wife and I went to New York. Mm -hmm. We rode in a taxi cab six times. Mm -hmm. Five times you had a the driver looked in the rear view mirror and greeted me by name. Oh. So of course then we Probably started. Probably he must have been watching Macharanga. Yeah, they, they yeah. watch Macharanga uh, television. Of course so. it's oh. only Macharanga they watch. Okay. And, and so they greet me by name and then we start talking. And two of them had their children, one was in medical school, and I forget the other was in university someplace. But you know, in one generation, you go from taxi cab driver to a yeah, doctor. Right. I mean, this is how Bangladeshis do in America. And I traveled, I traveled to New York, I traveled to Portland, Oregon, I traveled uh, Washington, D.C., I went to Los, uh, mm -hmm. Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go, I'm hunting down Bangladeshi Americans. Mm -hmm. And they are thriving and they want to give back to Bangladesh and I want to help them do that and they're also increasingly participating in the American political that's what I uh, want to do process yeah, okay that's good and, to and and it's interesting to talk to them see I don't engage in domestic politics true, in the United true. States right so when people start talking about that then I sort of, uh, shy, you sort away. of shy away but I know they're very much involved okay uh, and uh, now uh, we are coming to the close of this program, but uh, I have two more questions. One is, why Bangladesh is so important to U.S. foreign policy? Can you please clarify, explain? In oh, a, my in a goodness, religious? yes. Why is it so important? When I served here, 1998 to 2001, One. Bangladesh was a country that people like me fell in love with. I'm just being honest. No, absolutely. But to be equally honest, 
Washington's focus maybe at that time was elsewhere. But September 11, 2001 happened. And then September 12, 2001, all of a sudden, oh my goodness, there's Bangladesh right in the middle of the screen of strategically important countries. Mm -hmm. Because Bangladesh offers, uh, it is, first of all, it is, like I said, the seventh largest country in the world. It is a moderate country, a tolerant country, a secular country, um, a democratic country, and it offers a viable alternative to violent extremism in a very turbulent part of the world. So this is extremely important to, US, to America. Uh, mm -hmm. And then as Bangladesh improves its relations with India, with Nepal, Pakistan, uh, China, and now Burma, those uh, deepening ties improved stability in this region, region and right. that is important to America. I mentioned before how Bangladesh is the largest contributor of, inter of yeah. police men, of police women, of right. soldiers to international peacekeeping. That matters to the United States of America. So mm -hmm. you can see why Bangladesh is important so to the America. focus to Bangladesh uh, literally started after the 9-11 incident. Would you say well, that the US foreign policy? Would you say that? Bangladesh took on a strategic interest uh, uh, after 9-11. Oh. That, that was not there before. It was not there when I okay. served here before. Yeah, you were the political and economic counselor, I believe. That yes. Time. Oh, I had a great job. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. And I traveled uh, around the country then, too. Uh -huh. um, uh, Ambassador Mzina, um, we have come to the end of our program. But before that, uh, uh, let me thank you for visiting oh, our welcome, TV station Fahim. over here. I'm sure, uh, you know, our viewers must have uh, enjoyed the program. Oh, I hope so. And uh, you shared a lot of your views. We will continue doing so. And before that, I'd like to uh, request you if you want to say anything to our viewers in Bangladesh oh, and elsewhere. I would say that this is an amazing country. I have so much faith in, in Bangladesh. This is a country of the future. And when I look ahead, I do see Shona Bangla. I do see Bangladesh as a middle-income country. I do see Bangladesh as a country where families have a good shelter and uh, uh, ample and nutritious food, where children have access to quality education, where the family can get good health care. That's the Bangladesh I envision. And I think that Bangladesh will become a reality because of the Asian tiger I described earlier, because of the agricultural revolution underway right now, where this nation already is rice self-sufficient, yes. and I think within a decade can be food self-sufficient. Self can you imagine this? Yeah. These are yeah. wonderful things. I think Bangladesh now needs an education revolution mm -hmm. so that these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people have access to good education and are, are, are trained in skills and can go to the Middle East as skilled workers and semi-skilled workers, not just unskilled, can go to other countries of Southeast Asia and help build them can stay home and build this country. That is, that's the optimism that I have of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And I think many Bangladeshis share that optimism. Wonderful. Thank you, Ambassador Muzina. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, uh, let me say goodbye to our viewers. Uh, I'm sure you enjoyed Ambassador Muzina's uh, discussion with me. Uh, hopefully, we'll find another interesting guest in our next program. Thank you for being with us.